governments, especially the Canadian government, because this is where I find myself today, should take into cognizance or should have a system in place that identifies or recognizes activists or advocates who are in their country that whatever they have started shouldn't end to create the enabling environment you know for these people to connect i need to know people like myself people who are doing other things for their for their countries who find themselves here and to see how we can collaborate and also how we can lend our ideas also to the canadian government if I have done this in my country, I could be connected to other organizations here who are doing the same thing and to say, oh, this is how we do it back home. And these are some ideas I could as well share with you. So it's about connecting the dots, getting these people together, creating a network that would encourage them to keep working. So it's not because someone has left their country, the work should stop. No, it shouldn't stop because only the government cannot do it all for the people and that's why you have advocates like myself or the activists out there volunteers people who are willing who, who, who want to do these things selflessly but they need the support they need the, the buy-in from the government to say oh this is the environment you need create the enabling environment so they can thrive so they can give back to the people my name is Yukeria Oranta Okonkwo I'm currently a PhD student with the University of Ottawa. However, I have spent over 12 years working as an advocate um, for women and children. And um, part of that has been my career with the UN as well as other international organizations um, where I have led leadership positions as well as working as a gender specialist um trying to ensure that the rights of women and children are protected in nigeria it's been very interesting because for me um part of the reason why i am where i am has been that need for me to keep building on my knowledge i mean basically over the years i have worked towards expanding on my knowledge um uh, uh, in in terms of um theory because the practice is there already, but one needs to build on their um, knowledge. Um, Nigeria, popularly known as the giant of Africa, um, is a home to over 200 million people as we speak. However, Nigeria has its own challenges, um, based socio uh, socioeconomically, and politically as well. And um, this has led to issues of kidnapping, banditry um, in the Southwest region, as well as um, insurgency in the Northeast and uh, the separatist agitations in the Southeastern region as well. And these issues have a, a, a very sad way. It has affected women and children because at the end of the day, they bear the brunt because they're faced with poverty and economic hardship. And in such situations, you have more out of school children, you have women finding themselves in violent and abusive relationships. So it isn't like a very beautiful situation for the women and children right now in the country. Um, one of the things I always say to myself is the need to keep um, supporting women and children. And how would you do that if you don't constantly think about building yourself and your skills? So I'm currently here studying for my PhD in Gender and Women's Studies because um, I believe that the more knowledge you acquire, the more ideas you get towards advocating for, for the rights of women and children. And also it's an opportunity to build networks, to find out what other um, advocates are doing on other sides of the world. And um, I wouldn't categorize myself as someone who's an exile. Rather, I would say I am someone who is out here seeking knowledge to build on the work because there's so much work that needs to be done. And if you don't build, it becomes difficult for you to provide further support because there are limitations if you don't have the, the needed um, knowledge and capacity to keep pushing. 
I, I, I always don't want to call myself an activist because I see it more as an advocate, more, more like an advocacy. So I tend to see myself as an advocate for positive change. And basically it manifests every day in everything I do. I take it as it has to be part of me because um, it, it, it has a lot to do with my growing up, basically. So finding myself growing up in a low income um, society or environment, it has exposed me to a lot of societal issues, basically. So most of the way you see it would be how I work with other NGOs in, in Nigeria. I'm part of um, different networks. One of them is called the Child Protection Network of Nigeria. And basically what we do with that network, we try to um, advocate for children who need immediate support. And that was also part of my experience working with the Child Protection Network was what led me to joining UNICEF and working in the child protection section. So um, part of the work I did with UNICEF, aside being a specialist for gender and emergencies, I also headed the, um, the unit that worked on addressing issue of um, um, sexual exploitation and abuse of children, you know, in emergency context. Then the other network too I am a part of is the Women, Peace and Security Network of Nigeria. So what we also do, because Nigeria has its own security issues, um, try to ensure that we could bring in more women into the peace and security space. And this is in line with um, fulfilling the UN Resolution 1325 that calls for increased women's participation in peace processes. So not just you protecting the woman, no, we're, we're saying, she has to be part of the process, uh, the decision making, whatever that has to do with peace building. So that's what the body is out there to do. And the other um, way it manifests is also through my uh, participation in the Observatory Steering Committee. And what this committee does, it um, identifies and documents cases of violence against women and children, and also tries to provide them with um, um, immediate support. So aside documenting, we also understand the need that some of them might need psychosocial support or medical support. We try to make sure that these are gotten by referral, making sure that the survivor gets the, the exact support they need and on time. So these are, you know, some of the networks in which I try to uh, manifest the, the work I do because you just cannot do it on your own. And on the other hand, I also have uh, an NGO, which I also set up. It all feeds, it all feeds to my passion, you know, so everybody is doing everything. And the whole idea behind it, it's called Initiative for Data and Social Advancement is instead of replicating, instead of duplicating efforts rather, how can you make sure everybody is able to come to one stop, like a one stop shop to say, these are the issues, these are the things we've worked on, and these are the gaps. So basically what IDASA sets out to do, it's IDASA for sure, is to become like a, like a knowledge repository for the Niger Delta region, which is where I come from, where um, organizations can have real time data regarding issues of violence against women and children. Well, it's still at its incipient stages, but that's the whole idea, not to, not to duplicate efforts, but to support the organizations on the ground who are doing a beautiful work. So you don't go ahead duplicating, you say, no, this has been tackled. These are the areas where we need to work on, and these are the evidence that shows where the issues are. So it could also serve for donors who want to support different kinds of activities in the region to say, oh, according to the statistics from this organization, these are the challenges. And this is where we think the resources we're giving will be more useful and will give maybe greater impact at the end of the day. The major problem, as I speak to you, it's not about people who can do the work. There are a lot of hands already, but the question now is what needs to be done where's the most pressing needs and based on what evidence so the issue is with the evidence so how would this be a useful tool for them 
it's very simple because if you are providing actors with tangible evidence to support their work, it becomes easy to measure their impact in the region. So instead of organization A coming to say, oh, we worked with women of X community, we try to reduce the extent of violence against women and girls, to what extent, whose benchmark, whose baseline studies are you using? So because there's an organization on the ground who has the baseline data and continues to follow through um, quarterly reports to say, this is what organization A is doing and this is what organization B is doing. It's creating a network of organizations. So the players, the actors know who is doing what. And I don't have to do what you're doing because the data are there to say you are already doing it. But how can I partner with you? How can I build on what you have already done? Or oh, oh, could you be my sustainability plan if your project is going to last for five years? And mine is one. How about when I'm leaving, I hand over to you since you have the resources to keep going. This is something similar to what um, um, Medicine Sans Frontiers does. They work with the government. They hand over to the government. But in this situation, maybe the government, because right now, as we speak, the government doesn't have a, a clear um, uh, apparatus on the ground to say, oh, once you're done, we take over. Just the same way you have hospitals taking over the works of um, uh, Medicine Sans Frontiers. That's Doctors Without Borders. We don't have like uh, a government um, um, gender-based violence institution to say, oh, if this is your project, the institution. No, we have the we have the hospitals, the health facilities who might only provide you sustainability in terms of health care, which is not very comprehensive, if I, if I must say. So because that is not in place, you need these sort of systems to help organizations who are working on the ground to say, okay, I have your back. I have more funding, I have more resources. So once you're out, I could just adopt your beneficiaries and I'll continue the work. So somebody has to be there to tell a continuity story, more like one who has the institutional memory of how things are going and they keep handing over to the next organization that comes in. So whilst um, setting up IDASA, I had also worked with children in the past. Um, and one of the things I did on, on, a, on a British council funded project was setting up peace clubs for young children because um, the Niger Delta region of Nigeria also has its um, security issues. And one of the things we hope to see with that project or we envisage was a situation where we employ the catch them young approach. So um, instead of young children being co-opted into violent ways or taking up arms as child soldiers or be part of like the militants in the region, we set up peace clubs. So after school activities, they join the peace clubs. We offer peace education and also try to mentor them. So we pair them up with, with mentors. So after the project, you know, everything that starts has an end date when it has to do with donor funding. And I got so attached to these young people. So one of the best ways I felt to continue this mentorship for them was, you know, Setting up IDASA, not just only for the data bit of it, I felt IDASA could also be like a platform to continue the mentorship for these children. Because over the years, I have spoken to over 200 children across the Niger Delta region who have gone ahead to start speaking to other young people. And as a result of it, um, two kids got uh, funding from the Kids' Right organization, and one of them was nominated for the Kids' Right Award. Yeah, so um, through the funding they got, they were able to implement projects in their communities, uh, peace building projects to raise awareness because the extent to which children, young people get co-opted into militancy and, you know, gangster, gangsterism in the communities is very high. And at that stage, they needed that kind of support to lead them right. And some of them have gone to the level of also being enrolled in universities. That was exactly what the project did, but it has came in as a sustainability plan to make sure the good work didn't go to waste. 
Otherwise, we wouldn't know where these young people would be today. So they keep writing back to say, oh, I'm now in college. I'm in my first, I'm in my second year. So it's all thanks to that bridge that the organization has put in. So the organization on its own is a success story, even if it's not where it wants to be. But bridging the gap and coming in as a sustainability plan has helped ensure that the lives of these children who got impacted positively never came to an end. They have continued to the extent of also um, proceeding to being in the universities today. Every day I try to envisage, I try to see if that's that has that hope, that knowledge repository when it comes to real life information, real life data about the situation of women and children in the Niger Delta. I'm trying to limit it for now to the Niger Delta region because putting data together takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of work. So I don't want to sound um, um, overly ambitious at this point in time, but I'm thinking that in the next five years, there, has, there would be a structure on the ground where donors who come to the region and want to support can say, I will only support based on the evidence from this organization because what what I'm planning and hoping for it does is a situation where on a monthly basis they will be able to send out newsletters about the current trends of violence against women and children, the current trends about conflict situation, the current trends about women's involvement in peace processes, either as the good guys or the bad guys. Because it's important that these, um, these facts are well stated because it's not in every situation the woman is a victim. Sometimes she's a perpetrator and some of these things don't come to the limelight. So in five years time, we should have been able to build the repository to say we have been able to block all the gaps. Now, at this point in time, organizations know who their competitors are or who their partners are, who are they working with, who should they be collaborating with to meet a common goal and not competing basically because that's the whole idea we want to create a safe world for women and children we shouldn't be competing we should be collaborating we should be partnering with each other since the goal is the same but how would they know if idasa doesn't come in to bridge this knowledge gap to say no you have done this it wouldn't make any sense if you do the same thing but this is the gap from the other organization and if you have come here and you're able to fill this gap it will make even a more positive impact in the lives of the recipients or the people